you here. Thank you very Sir Terry, much everybody. Thank you. Well, it is a pleasure to be here um, at the Innovation Conference and in Poland. These are two subjects close to my heart. I spent many, many years uh, coming backwards and forwards uh, to Poland. My first visit was about 1992. Um, and uh, you may know that uh, Tesco was a pioneer in e-commerce, starting the, probably the first uh, food online business. Right, well, Napoleon called Britain a nation of shopkeepers. And he meant that as an insult. Uh, but the British took him literally. So much so that when this story begins, Actually, around the time I first visited Poland in 1992, the world's most profitable retailer was a British company, Marks and & Spencer. And the world's most profitable supermarket was also a British company, Sainsbury. And these were icons, not just of retailing, but actually of British society. They represented the pinnacle of business achievement. And I think I've got a, a, a chart here which shows the market value on the stock market in 1992 of those two companies. Pure coincidence, they were valued at about the same amount. Well, where was Tesco at this time? Well, this is a quote from the Times, the London Times newspaper. And it's pretty damning. If you want quality, shop at Sainsbury. If you want price, shop at the discounter. Now, the, these were the German discounters, Lidl and Aldi, you know them very well, not beer drunker, uh, that were flooding in to the UK at that time. And they were predicted to take about a 25% share of the market which meant that one of the major players would get knocked out. And everyone thought it was going to be Tesco. Uh, and you can see what he says. Tesco is stuck in the middle. Who wants to shop there? Actually, I just joined the board of Tesco in 1992 as the first marketing director. And I, my job was to solve this problem. Uh, and I actually was interviewed by this journalist the day before he wrote this damning verdict. So I obviously didn't impress him with my plans. Uh, and here was the market value of Tesco at that time. We were about a half to a third of the value of the two powerful market leaders. And you'll know in business, it's with a, in, a, in a mature business like retailing, it's very rare for a distant number two to overtake powerful brand leaders. So if we go forward now to 2011, the year I left Tesco, you'll see, amazingly, after 20 years, Marks and & Spencer and Sainsbury are still worth about the same amount of money on the stock market. Uh, and here's Tesco. And it is one of the most remarkable uh, and unlikely turnarounds in British business history. No one. 20 years ago would have predicted that Tesco would have become the number one retailer in the UK and gone on to be the th world's third largest retailer behind Carrefour and Walmart. And uh, as Nadine says, I, I have written some of the lessons I learned from that change in a book called Management in 10 Words, because I think it has um, lessons, not just for retailers, but for anyone in any organization, public or private, large or small, because it's how you get the best out of people, how you get the best out of the environment you find yourselves in. <clears throat> and actually, very relevant to this conference, the difference between Tesco's success and Sainsbury and Mark's relative failure was innovation. We innovated out of the environment we found ourselves in, even in a low growth industry like retailing, and that made the difference. We changed the rules, and we were able to grow for 15 years at 
more than 10% every year in a market only growing at two, just by innovating. The first lesson I want to talk to you about is probably the most important that I learned, which is you have to find the truth. It's incredibly difficult for any individual, actually, to know truly how others see them. If you think then of an organization with as many people as this in the room, or even bigger, it's very hard to get a collective view of how the organization is seen by its outside world, by its customers, by its competitors. And the problem with that is if you don't know truly the position of the business, you're condemned to steer it in the wrong direction. If you don't know your starting place, you'll never find uh, the goal that you're setting for the business. And human nature gets involved. No one likes to, be the, to bring bad news from the marketplace into the business. There's lots of data, but actually more data, if it's not used tr in a truthful way, can just mislead the company even more. And one of the problems today, particularly in organizations, is all this data comes flooding in, but it's trapped down at the bottom of the organization, in the sales department, or the research department, or the marketing department. And as it comes up through the organization, it gets filtered, and all of the bad news is taken out, and all of the good news <laughs> is amplified. So that by the time it gets to the chief executive, it's a complete fairy tale. And if you've ever looked at your chief executive and thought he looks a bit detached from reality, well, partly <laughs> it's because of all the doctored information you've been feeding them over the years. Uh, and this is a real problem. It's really difficult for businesses to really know what's going on, to really know how they're doing so that they can confront it. I found that the best guide, the most reliable guide, was your customer. Now, for us, that was the consumer. The, 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 for you, it might be a client, uh, but it was your customer. They had the least ax to grind. They would tell you what you were good at, what you were not so good at, and if you were prepared to keep listening, they'd actually give you your strategy. And I never had to worry where growth was going to come from. Once I'd decided to keep Tesco as close to customers as possible, once I'd decided to follow the customer wherever they went, I never had to look for growth in the business because they always had new needs and that gave me new business opportunities. Audacious goals really do matter in business. This is Jim Collins's uh, uh, theory, and he's right. I'll just step away from Tesco. This is my home city of Liverpool, uh, Nadine mentioned. Uh, and Liverpool, at, at one time, was the second city of the British Empire. And the reason for that was it was the port for the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, which happened within about 50 miles of Liverpool. Inventions, mainly in textile production and uh, energy generation actually changed the whole shape of the economic world. For centuries, the East had been about two-thirds of the world's GDP, but because of this Industrial Revolution, Europe and the West, for 200 years, accounted for two-thirds of the world's GDP. Actually, it's just shifting back now uh, to China and to India. So Liverpool boomed. At one time, it controlled 40% of the world's traded goods out of the city. And you can mark the decline of Liverpool by the sinking of the Titanic 100 years ago, which was owned by the city. And it had a terrible 20th century. Uh, the population halved. Um, it was bombed heavily in the war, never rebuilt uh, in the city centre. About 10 years ago, I was asked to come back to Liverpool to join a board for the regeneration of the city. And I, I found morale very, very low. Uh, people had no hope. It was so bad that they'd never built a modern shopping centre 
um, in the city. And the experts said, well, Liverpool, the best you can hope for is a shopping center of about 25,000 square meters. Well, we built a shopping center of 170,000 square meters. We set a really audacious goal. We actually, it wasn't a covered center, we rebuilt the quarter of the city center that had been bombed 50 years ago and reintegrated it back into the city. We took 20 famous architects to build uh, parts of the city center. It moved Liverpool from number 17 to number four as a shopping destination in one year. As a result, four billion pounds of investment came into this small city center. It's not much bigger than Poznan, uh, about a square mile. And it was mainly private money, building the first office blocks for 30 years, the first hotels, conference centers, apartments. The population of the city center went from naught to 30,000, and it really revitalized the city. It, after 100 years of decline, it became the fastest growing metropolitan city in the UK f for, the, for, this, for the last 10 years. It even became a tourist attraction, a uh, number three tourist center after London and Edinburgh because of the Beatles uh, and the fact that Everton Football Club are based there. So it's amazing what can happen if you set an audacious target. Uh, and these are the targets I set for Tesco when I became chief executive in 1997. Number one in the UK, um, we hadn't yet overtaken Marks and Spencer. Most people thought Sainsbury anyway would overtake Tesco. To be as strong in non-food, that's general merchandise and clothing, as we were in food, because at the time Tesco only sold food. But Walmart had just come into our market and we knew we, we had to learn this big industry if we were going to compete. I wanted to invent services retailing. Um, as you know, in developed countries, people spend more on services like telephones, uh, online, uh, finance, insurance, entertainment, as, as they do on products like clothing or food. So I didn't want our business to be trapped into the declining part of the market. So could you retail banking? Could you retail telecommunications? Could you go online? And we did, uh, and we developed very good businesses there. And finally, retailing is one of the last industries to go global. And uh, actually that's become easier with e-commerce, and we might talk about that later in the panel. But it is difficult because the economics are very local. But it is becoming a global industry, and I wanted Tesco to be a player in that. You couldn't stay a world leader just in the UK with 2% of the world's GDP. A Polish company can't stay a world leader if it just stays in, in Poland. Now, any one of these would have been seen as ambitious targets. To do all four, frankly, was probably a bit reckless. But what I will say is it was a fantastic motivator for everybody in Tesco. Tesco people were really proud after years of being, you know, number three and not taken seriously, really proud to be part of such an ambitious set of targets. And they came to work every day really believing in what the business was trying to do and giving all of their talents to the business. And we pretty much did it. We pretty much did it. Vision, values, and culture matter more in business success, the soft side of management, than the hard side. They matter more than marketing, than strategy, than even IT, uh, than finance, because it's these things, the culture of the business, that really speaks to humans, to the human heart. And humans are incredibly talented people but they can't be inspired by cold profits and cold statistics and market share and so on. They've got to feel that your business is doing something worthwhile 
something useful. Uh, and Michael Port has begun to talk about this, about um, you know, don't see CSR and charity as different, but actually build a business that's doing something worthwhile. Uh, and this is what can really uh, inspire uh, the people uh, in your business. These are the values of Tesco. They didn't come from a management consultant or from the boardroom. We just got groups of Tesco staff, uh, smaller groups than this, um, uh, and there were a lot of Tesco staff, so it took over a year. And, and we asked them just two questions. The first question was, well, you've worked in Tesco a long time. What do you think it stands for? And they said, well, we think no one tries harder for customers. We just overtaken Sainsbury and done a lot of things uh, on that. Uh, and we asked the second question, which was, well, what would you like Tesco to stand for? And that was the second answer, treat people how we like to be treated. So they wanted a business that was collaborative, consensual, respectful. And that's what we built the future of Tesco on, two simple pillars of service towards customers, built the whole organization around customers and basic good manners in terms of how we worked within the organization. And that created trust and confidence. And trust and confidence are the two most valuable qualities you can have, ever have in an organization. Because that's what brings people out of themselves and they can share their talents with the talents of other people in the organization. And then, if you can do it, if, you can, if your brand image can be a true reflection of your internal values, that's a very strong position. And so we came up with every little helps. And what we were saying is we're trying to understand ordinary people's difficult and busy lives, and we're trying to work out ways in which we can help a bit. You know, we're not going to solve all the problems, but we can help a bit. And we had an advertising campaign featuring two famous British actresses, Jane Horrocks and Prunella Scales. Prunella Scales was Mrs. Faulty in Faulty Towers. Uh, and they basically told stories, they were, you know, a, a, as a typical family of Tesco shoppers uh, and how Tesco helped them out. Follow the customer. Well, Businesses change slowly, even in technology, when compared with how quickly customers can change. They can change overnight. Their interests, their beliefs, their fashions, uh, their worries, um, their tastes, just change overnight. And they can leave a business out of date. It's quite a worrying thing. There's not much you can do about it. The only thing you can do is get as close to customers as you possibly can with good research, uh, make sure your whole business is facing the customer, so that when they do change, you're the first to find out. And you've got one chance to respond with a new product or a new service that meets that new need in the customer. And if you do that, the customer will know that you've changed to help them. And that's what builds loyalty. If you're forced to do it, by a competitor and you come second, that doesn't have the same effect. This is Tesco Express. Um, the economics of retailing, modern retailing, was bigger is better. Um, you closed small stores and you opened big stores where everybody shopped once a week with a car. And as we chatted to customers, though, they said, we're getting busier and busier. We don't have time always to get organized to go to your big store once a week and get everything that we need in the hypermarket. Actually, it was worse for young people. Young men, they weren't organized around anything. They, they, you know, they just got hungry and looked for their mother. So we thought, well, if people won't come to us, can we miniaturize what we do and take it to them and put it in the university campus, in the high street, in the village? And it wasn't easy, actually, um, but we did it. Uh, we called it Tesco Express. 
There are now thousands of Tesco Expresses all over the world. Convenience retailing uh, is the fastest growing part of retailing after e-commerce. E-commerce is first, then convenience uh, retailing. All of that, all the billions of pounds of turnover, hundreds of millions of pounds of profit, came just from a simple observation about how people saw their lives changing. It was an innovation. People uh, ask me, all these things, visions, targets, goals, how do you actually make them relevant to the work an ordinary member of staff does each day? You know, how do you connect what I do today with all this big picture stuff? Well, we use the balance scorecard, Kaplan and Norton. Uh, we called it the steering wheel, we had it specially developed, and it was fantastic because you could put down simple measures uh, and you could connect every job and the measures and the targets for that job right through the organization to the big targets for the business. So if you go in a Tesco store anywhere in the world, you'll see uh, a balance scorecard, a steering wheel for that store. Every member of staff will know what they have to do. They'll also know how they're doing and it's connected up to the country, to the department, to the division, to the whole group. So people really do feel, A, they know what the whole business is doing, but B, they know what they have to do and how they're contributing to the big picture. And it really does make <coughs> a big difference. Now, of course, you can see there's not many words on there. So the trick with this is you've got to keep it very, very simple. People also ask me, how do you get things done? And, uh, you know, everyone has big ideas and so on. You know, you go to a meeting and it's very exciting, but nothing ever happens. How do you actually take a decision and actually change reality for customers as a result of that decision? Well, it isn't easy and you do have to work at it. And uh, there are five steps. First, you actually have to make a clear decision. It's amazing in businesses, in organizations, how you have a four hour long meeting and when you walk out, nobody knows if anything was decided. So you have to make a clear decision, you have to write it down. We had to change the way we organized our meetings so that we were clear we'd made a decision. You then have to have discipline because before a decision, have all of the conversation and dissent and argument, but once you've made the decision, everybody has to back it. That takes discipline. As leaders, when we go out of a meeting, we've got to represent that decision, whether we like it or not, in the organization. People look to us to see whether we believe in that decision. Then you've got to anything, any decision to become a reality, a number of things, events have to take place and you have to write them down. It's called a process. It sounds boring and it is boring, but it is absolutely essential to getting anything done. And then you have to decide what every person is going to do in that process. Because if you don't, people will just come to work and do whatever they like or do what they did before and that's not what you need. You've got to clearly define the job role. And finally, as you know, if you want to scale it, if you want to make it cheaper, more reliable, happen everywhere, you've got to write it into an IT system. And so much goes wrong with IT systems because people haven't developed the process clearly in the first place and they haven't identified the job roles, and that's why when you see big IT failures, that's always what's gone wrong. Just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll flick on. Data is priceless in business. Um, this is Clubcard, and as I travel around post Tesco, actually um, Clubcard is more famous than Tesco. And I think the reason for that is it was the first example of a big company managing its relationship with its customers through data. And it couldn't happen before this because computers weren't powerful enough to hold data about products and customers. 
This is only in 1995. Um, and it transformed the performance of Tesco. It, it, it propelled us to number one uh, in the business. Uh, it dramatically improved our marketing because we could do tailored marketing based on the individual interests and needs of customers. Uh, and as you know, people screen out information that's not relevant to them. So tailoring it based on what you knew they were interested in transform marketing. Now, this is very important today because, of course, with e-commerce, with online, we have so much more data that we can use in order to tailor goods and services to individual uh, customers. And actually, it was because of Clubcard that we were able, Tesco was able to create its e-commerce business. And one of the great breakthroughs was because we um, uh, knew what people bought, we could actually give them the record of what they purchased called favorites, which made it so much quicker for people to shop online. And I'll give you an example. We might sell 40,000 products in a store, but actually an individual customer will only ever buy from a group of about three or 400 products in the course of a year. So you can actually let them know what those are, and it makes for a much, much quicker uh, shopping trip. Competition is good. Now, nobody likes competitors that are always trying to do you out of a job, but actually, competitors are great for your business because they force you to do your best work for customers. Uh, and the trick is to learn from competitors quicker than they can learn from you. Uh, and don't look for their weaknesses, always look for their strengths. And this is an exciting time with e-commerce, it's an exciting time for retailing, and hopefully in the panel afterwards we'll talk much more about that. But the, there's amazing changes with pure online retailers, with traditional retailers like Tesco developing online businesses, with retailers crossing borders, both with bricks and mortar, but also crossing borders with online. There's plenty of British online retailers exporting very rapidly around the world. And the trick is you've got to learn from all these people. Don't shrink away from them. Actually go out and find out who's the best in the world at your business and see what you can learn from them. You know, don't hope that they won't come to Poland. They will, but be ready actually, and you might find out that you've got something to teach them, and that will give you confidence, and you'll go to other countries around the world. And finally, leadership. It does matter in business. Actually, many of you will be entrepreneurs. It's important that you're an entrepreneur, but you've also got to be a leader. And the definition of leadership that I like is a leader will take you further than you would go on your own, because it gets to the heart of leadership. It's not what you do in the end that matters, it's what you inspire other people to do. How you build their sense of esteem and their confidence and their trust, it's the trust you put in them more than the trust you expect from them as a leader that really matters, uh, and that can be uh, transformational. Okay, I'll, I'll end there just with uh, an eye on time because uh, Nadine and I want to uh, say a few words together. But uh, thanks for listening and I look forward to talking to you later at the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you very much, Sir Terry. Um, fascinating stuff there. Uh, when you were talking about the importance of Clubcard that really launched e-commerce as we know it today from Tesco, how important is e-commerce in the mix now? W what is the relationship between your traditional approach and e-commerce? <coughs> it, it's very important and my successor Phil Clark has put the internet right at the heart of his strategy. You know, um, Tesco has not had many leaders in its history and uh, so it's important for the new CEO to mark out the one thing that they want to be remembered by and for Phil the one thing is the internet, that's how important it is and uh, uh, Tesco's uh, e-commerce business is already several billion pounds uh, a year 
and uh, is growing, you know, double digits. And do you see that growth continuing? So roughly as a percentage, what is it contributing at the moment? You mentioned it's several billion. Yeah. But what does that mean in percentage terms? Well, be, Tesco is, is large. So uh, at the moment, it would be less than 10%. It would be about 7%, I'd guess. Um, but it, it will grow as a percentage very rapidly because of the investments, because we'll develop uh, large online businesses in all of our countries, okay. uh, here in Central Europe, uh, in Asia, uh, United States, and, and in the UK. And I'm going to go to the audience in just a moment. So if you've got a question for Terry, then please be ready to have your hand up and the mics will be out at the moment. Before I do that, just very interesting how the world of e-commerce, you talked about cross-border, that multi-channel approach, and those pure players, the likes of eBay, mm -hmm. Pixmania, are now becoming a clicks and bricks and going yeah. truly cross-border. The Lego group, obviously, have got a big prominence in Central yeah. Eastern Europe, Rakuten in Asia as well as yeah. making great play. They've bought play.com. What is holding back cross-border at the moment from being bigger than what it already is? Because I think you mentioned earlier about the economics of e-commerce yeah. is <clears throat> local. Well, tr traditionally um, with bricks and mortar retailing, uh, what held it back was different regulations in different countries. It was very capital intensive to build these big physical networks of stores and all the distribution and everything else, uh, as well as different tastes, you know, tastes in fashion. Uh, I remember when I first came to Poland, the tastes in fashion were quite different, I found, uh, compared to other parts of the world, whereas now, you know, it's changing. Um, the, the good thing about e-commerce is it can actually leap a lot of those mm. problems. It's less regulated, you don't have the capital intensity. Uh, and because people go online, you know, uh, fashions are traveling much faster uh, around the world. And, um, but one of the things that e-commerce is missing that, that actually is still an obstacle for cross-border is a supply chain. When you go back to the early 1980s, physical stores never had supply chains, so they were always out of stock, unreliable, the service wasn't so good. So they had to build their own warehouses and their own sourcing. The same thing is needed now for e-commerce businesses. And uh, a, a business I've invested in called Metapack is actually building a virtual supply chain for e-commerce businesses. So it handles all of the integration of postal companies, labeling lists, shippers, and so on, so that an e-commerce business can get to the customer very reliably at low cost, delivering a very good service. And, that, and that's, that's the leap that's needed so that uh, e-commerce can become more international. But those postal carriers, to a certain extent, you're reliant on what it's like from country to country. Some rules are more liberated. It's a very liberated market in the UK. France, probably less so. You've got the likes of DHL under the inspirational leadership of Frank Apple, who's really pushing the boundaries mm. of cross-border trade. I think I get a sense that's probably another two or three years before the postal companies truly come together to get cross-border correct. Is there anything more they could be doing, do you think, to understand that space? Well, um, I think they should be talking to Metapack. Okay. <laughs> Good <laughs> you answer. Know, I, I, I think the, the, uh, uh, you'll see the emergence of integrators, mm. virtual integrators mm. of shippers, postal companies, mm. uh, and so on, both nationally and internationally. Mm. Um, to create this virtual supply chain. Okay, well, let's see if you've got a question for Terry. Now is your golden opportunity. Maybe you're setting up a business or you're running a business at the moment and something's inspired you, you need some clarification. So do you have a question? Please put up your hand. We've got, um, can anybody help me see anybody? If we get the lights up a little bit, we can see anybody out there. Do you have a question or, you, or everything been answered? You've heard from, ah, there's a lady here. Can we just wait for the microphone to come to you? If you'd like to keep your hand up. If you could say who you are, where you're from, and your question, that'd be great. I'm Katerina. I'm from the Czech Republic, from a company called NetDirect. We are a member of the Allegro Group. And I have a question. You were talking about the, um, all the beliefs that you have to maintain when you're running a company. But the problem is when you grow really big, when you grow as big as Tesco is, mm. How do you maintain this? I mean, how do you teach all the people? How do you teach all the subsidiaries to actually follow mm. the rules that you have set for the company? 
and I can say I don't want to be critical, but when you visit Tesco these days, for example, in the Czech Republic, like in a small town of Ostrava that I come from, um, it's not as good as I would expect it to be, or it's not as good as it used to be. <laughs> so, sorry. Actually, it will be by tomorrow, I can assure you. Okay. <laughs> There's a phone call going in already. Okay, Great th question. Thank you for thank the you. answer. Yeah, I, I know Ostrava, actually. Um, <laughs> the, I've been there a few times. The, the, um, as a company gets bigger, it, it gets more complex. Um, so, uh, if you take the example of Tesco, where it was maybe one category food in one format, a supermarket in one country, it became many categories of products in many formats, from little, you know, online right the way through to hypermarkets in many countries. So, there's lots more complexity. The only way you can cope with that is as the business gets bigger, you've got to mentally see it as smaller. And w as it gets more complex, you've got to manage in a, in a simpler way and uh, give a lot of thought to what really matters in business. And you'll find there's only a few things that matter. That's why my book was called 10 Words. You know, the, the things that really matter, it's a short list. Uh, and, and, and they're old ideas, they're universal ideas. And if you can manage your business by those values, those simple principles, it's more possible to move those around the world. Um, rule books um, don't travel very well. You know, they don't reflect what's going on locally. They take away um, the trust in the front line. Uh, so, it's far better to give people shared values and principles about how to respond, how to behave, and let them uh, manage it on the ground. Um, and, you know, in a big business like uh, Tesco, uh, some stores will be better than others. They'll have good periods and bad periods. Uh, but, but as long as you've got common beliefs about the customer, about the business, generally you can sustain uh, a good effort, uh, even in complex times. Now you're coming back for the panel discussion. Just very quickly, finally, this region, in a way, has been under the radar of many big retailers from around the world. What are they missing out from not coming to Central Eastern Europe? A lot, you know, there's um, uh, big populations, um, uh, the um, big consumer demand, growing markets, um, uh, loyal c customers, um, and lots of talent, very well educated people that you can bring into the business here, and you know, they're prepared to go on and do well elsewhere because people in um, Eastern Europe uh, know that, uh, that you know, no one's going to give them a living, so they've got ambition and fire in the belly mm -hmm. to go on and make a living for themselves. Well, we look forward to having you later on as part of the panel when we'll be looking at retail. But in the meantime, it's an absolute pleasure to have you over here in Poznan. Please show your appreciation for Sir Terry Leahy. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you.